There are plans to expand indoctrination. That's right. Well, Idahoans are also concerned. Horror shot. That line would be moving a little bit farther west. I'm like crying. Nobody wants to Dark see. Dark money is influencing policy in our state. Well, that's not how this works. Well, hello there and welcome to Nowhere to Hide. I'm Brian Hyde and we're going to be tackling one of the thornier issues today of media bias. It has a lot to do with euphemistic language, but in this case, we're going to be focusing specifically on who is looking out for the children and, and specifically referring to the, the ongoing, very divided and polarizing debate over transgender surgeries, which is currently being addressed here in the state of Idaho via legislation that has been proposed in a bill which is actually advanced that uh, would criminalize performing those kinds of, uh, of surgeries as well as certain hormonal treatments and permanent kinds of, of gender treatment, gender affirming treatment, I guess is, is what uh, its proponents call it, on underage minors. Now, before we go any further, I know that this is, is stirring some strong feelings and some people ha have been very vocal critics and, and very angry at how could anybody even begin to suggest that uh, this is some place where, where people would want to butt in, right? This is a person's private life. Well, again, we're talking about minors, and and I saw this uh, I saw this meme the other day. This is actually just a, it's a tweet, is all it is, but it sums it up rather well. Some people are afraid of being called a transphobic bigot. I'm afraid of being a bystander to the chemical castration and bodily mutilation of children. We are not the same, and we never will be. Now, let's take a look at some of the headlines that that are currently uh, popping up here around the gym state. This is from the Idaho Capital Sun. Idaho panel approves a bill that would make medical care for trans youth a felony. That's kind of a broad headline considering uh, medical care. Really? So, you know, they break their arm. Tough luck, kid. You know, if you're uh, you think you're transgender, we can't treat you. No, this it's in other words, it's it's a misleading headline right out of the gate. It's not denying medical care, but it is saying there are certain types of care and certain procedures which ought to be off limits while a youth is a youth <clears throat> before that that person is is of age to make that decision for themselves the committee heard from out of state witnesses trans kids adults and parents so here are a few excerpts from the story again this is from the Idaho Capital Sun republican lawmakers in an Idaho house committee voted tuesday to restrict the rights of parents to decide on and physicians to provide medical care for transgender idahoans under the age of 18 spin 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 audrey you're doing such a wonderful job i hope hope you can keep that spin up because you got a lot of plates going right now but what they're talking about here is restricting access to certain permanent procedures which a person may very well regret having done on the spur of the moment. Now, ultimately, this is the kind of decision that is going to be up to a person. Now, we presume a person who can make their own decisions, or in the case of a child, parents who can hopefully make these kinds of decisions for their child. But we're talking permanent things, whether it be hormone blockers, whether it be um, sexual uh, assignment surgery, that kind of thing. It doesn't just go away at the drop of a hat. You know, you can, you can sterilize a young person through the use of hormone blockers. And of course, with, with surgical procedures, they're cutting off healthy body parts that do not grow back. So it, it's disingenuous to say, well, this is just restricting the rights of parents to decide on and for physicians to provide medical care. It's certain procedures that would make permanent changes to a young person who may or may not be in a position to make that fully informed decision. The Idaho House Judiciary Rules and Administration Committee voted 14 to 13 along party lines to send the bill to the House with a due pass recommendation. That sets it up for consideration and a vote on the House floor in the coming days of the legislative session. Now, some who testified and some committee members themselves noted that the votes conflict with the GOP lawmakers' longtime support for parental rights and medical freedom. Okay, here's this is muddying of the water on issues like immunizations, child protection and child welfare cases, sex education, masks, and Idaho's statutory protection for the practice of faith healing. Look over that list, immunizations, child protection, child welfare cases, sex education, masks, and tell me how many of those are things that, that could not be changed if a person chose to change them. Parents should be calling the shots when it comes to immunizations. Child protection and welfare cases, well, sometimes the system is wrong, so there need to be some safeguards built in that defer to parents as the primary authority and parents as the primary stewardship, as opposed to the state, you know, and the parents, you know, with the grudging permission of the state. 
Sex education, same thing. Parents, it's your responsibility first and foremost. Masks, really, Audrey? <laughs> You're still pushing those masks? Okay, you want to throw that in there? But yeah, parents should be able to make those decisions for their kids as well. And of course, the practice of faith healing. And this is the beginning. You're going to see there's a pattern here. Well, you know, there's those religious people. They're obviously the ones who are opposed to this gender-affirming care. And notice how faith healing is in quotation marks, as if it's something real, as if it's something people might actually believe in. Huh, can you believe in this sophisticated day and age? Just a little condescension on the part of your legacy media. Now, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, the standard of gender-affirming care, by the way, that term, if anything, deserves to be in quotation marks, gender-affirming care, that's probably one that should be, for transgender children and teens, includes social affirmation as the person begins to dress, use pronouns, and make other changes associated with gender. Okay, understandable, but see, those things are not irreversible, right? You can change the clothes you're wearing. You can change what pronouns you're using. You can, uh, you know, there, there are other things about that that are not permanent. Trans youth, and this, this is where they downplay it, trans youth may also need mental health care. I think that's true. In fact, I think that's really where it needs to start as far as the, the care that, that's required. For some, medical care may include surgeries. Oh, what, what was that? Oh, surgeries. Surgeries, as in cutting off healthy body parts, hormones, or puberty blockers that hold off the physical changes of puberty, such as facial hair growth and breast development. Now, I don't know if that's intentional. Maybe I'm just reading more into it. It's very possible that I'm just looking for a reason here to nitpick, but it seems like Audrey's really downplaying the uh, the surgeries part because that is one of the main things that, that uh, the people promoting this bill and the parents who testified on behalf of it, that's what they're addressing. Things that cannot be easily undone. And just because the uh, Academy, American Academy of Pediatrics is saying, well, this is what we recommend. I'm sorry, but uh, big medicine, you've got a few question marks and a few things that you need to answer for that uh, probably need to be resolved before we put our undying faith and trust in you once again. You have a tendency like uh, the American Psychiatric Association had back in 1974 to simply go along with what's trendy. That's when, by the way, the uh, APA, the American Psychiatric Association, removed homosexuality from their DSM manual of mental disorders, not based on science, but simply on a voice vote, a political vote. How many of us would like to see this out of here? Uh, yeah, okay, then it's done, but it had nothing to do with science. Okay, here's another headline. This is from KTVB. Another alarming look here. House committee pushes toward bill, pushes forward bill rather, to make most gender affirming care quotation marks, for minors, a felony for those who would provide it. Yes, it's not like they're trying to go after the minors and, and, and charge them with something. Medical professionals did testify in support of H-71, but here's the disqualifier. Here's why you shouldn't listen to them. Some of them were religious-based, like Hilbert Nelson, who is a Christian counselor in Pocatello. Nelson said he believes gender-affirming ther therapy is driven by, ah, there's the quotation marks, woke ideology, as if that's something that actually exists. I know it's a small thing, but, you know, unless you're doing a direct quotation or unless you're trying to give the impression that this is some made-up imaginary thing, this is my friend's, uh, or this is my buddy's friend, Harvey the Giant Rabbit. <laughs> oh, aren't we smart, you know? It's, it's not something that's real, or at least that's the message that they're trying to send. Now, this story from KTVB says the American Medical Association has continually voiced their concerns over cinder, similar legislation barring transgender care. The AMA says in a press release from 2021, transgender children, like all children, have the best chance to thrive when they are supported and can obtain the health care they need. On the surface, it's tempting to just agree and say, well, of course, that seems like a self-evident thing. Here's the subtext, though, that isn't addressed, and that is... Um, and, and, and tell me, how, how does the, uh, you know, how does the healthcare industry, how does the medical establishment benefit from this? What's that you say? Oh, the, the hormone replacement therapies, the, the counseling, the surgeries, the follow-up that go on for years and years and years. It's quite a moneymaker. As I've mentioned before, it's a multi-billion dollar industry and it's growing with more and more healthcare providers starting to offer gender-affirming care clinics. Somebody's got their hand out because they see this as a chance to make money. And I'm sorry, that doesn't reduce all medicine to just simply, well, we're just trying to get rich. But you have to admit, that's a pretty powerful incentive for groups like the AMA to jump on board and, and to uh, support this. And here's another thing that, that comes into play, and that is, 
if this is so on the up and up, first of all, they wouldn't have to use quotation marks, you know, to disqualify those who don't call it gender affirming care. But look at this article from Fox News. Idaho schools instructed to keep parents in the dark about students' gender and name transitions. See, this is part of the larger problem. And this, when people step up and say, well, why would such legislation even be considered in the first place? It's because it's becoming clear that there are people who are taking direct aim at our children. And that's not something that can go unanswered. That's not something that should just be waved off as well. You know, <laughs> politicians going to politician or activists are going to activist. The Idaho School Boards Association says school employees should not disclose a student's transgender status to parents without consent or legitimate need to know. In other words, secrets being kept between the school district or its personnel and the child, but keeping the parents out of the loop. Huh, what could possibly go wrong there? Fox News reports school districts throughout Idaho have been adopting policies to keep parents in the dark about their children's gender identity and sexual orientation at the instruction of the Idaho School Boards Association. According to school district policies and email correspondence obtained through Freedom of Information Act requests by parents defending education, which were shared with Fox News Digital. So for those who are saying, oh, it's source, well, it's the... Uh, School Boards Association, the ISBA, documents themselves. School employees should not disclose the student's transgender status or sexual orientation to other individuals, regardless of setting, including the other school personnel or, in the case of middle school, junior high, and high school students, the student's parents, guardians, unless they have a legitimate need to know or unless the student has authorized such disclosure, the school district policies read. Okay, let's take just a moment and, and unpack this. At what point is it good for a child to be keeping secrets from their parents, and potentially life-altering secrets from their parents? I, you know, I'll let you answer that for yourself, but first of all, you don't need someone stepping in and, and acting as some kind of an intermedi intermediary between the student and their parents. And I get it. Not every parent is going to respond favorably to their kid coming home and saying, Mom, Dad, you know, I'm LGBT in whatever flavor of LGBT plus they, they, they choose. But at the same time, whose responsibility is it primarily for the raising of that child? It's the parent. And I'm suggesting that these, these school entities, any outside entity has no reason to be stepping up and, and interposing itself between parents and their children. That's just wrong. And it needs to be called out as such. Nicole Nelly, Neely, the president of Parents Defending Education, told Fox News Digital that it's time for local school districts to take a stand against these unaccountable bureaucracies and to cut off the spigot. She says this is further proof that living in a red state doesn't protect families from these issues in school and that the traditional power brokers in education policy who families have trusted for many years, like school board associations, are as much a part of the problem as well-known activist groups. Ouch. But I don't think she's wrong. She said it's worth noting that school, state school board associations are funded by dues from local school boards, which themselves are paid for through taxes. The Payette School District, by the way, pushed back against that provision about parental notification in December of 2021. That's according to email correspondence obtained through the Freedom of Information Act request. Emails show that a Payette School District employee had informed an ISBA member, our board refuses to remove parent rights for a minor, which caused the ISBA member to advise the district to consult its own attorney. Well, apparently they did that, and when they impl implemented their policy, they specifically left out the part about you shall not say anything to parents, you know, without uh, express permission from the student beforehand. I know it, it seems like like a stretch for some people, but... If you look back at uh, some of the various leftist revolutions that have taken place uh, within recent memory, driving a wedge between children and their parents, destroying the cohesion of the family has always been one of the goals, simply because there can be no competing authority between the party or the ideology and, uh, and the individual who is being co-opted into that mindset. Now, does that mean they're all being co-opted into a communist cult? Well, I hope not. But the methods would seem to indicate that uh, there are people who are trying to use whatever means available to, again, get between kids and their parents. And I think this is this is one of those things when, when they when they put woke ideology, you know, in quotation marks, like as if that thing really exists, it all fits together. 
And part of the woke ideology is, well, your parents, we need to, first of all, get to get everything they taught you out of your mind so that you can be reprogrammed. I'll, in fact, I'll use a different word, groomed to be a good little leftist activist. I know that word makes people uncomfortable. That's why I use it. It should make you uncomfortable because it's it's treading into a place where really it shouldn't be in the first place. And here's here's another example of, of what that grooming looks like. Here's a tweet from... Uh, well, actually, here's a tweet from Brian Allman. Then I'm going to show you the, the one that, that shows the, the grooming. Brian says, look, I get it. People, a lot of people hate politics and culture war. You just want to work, send your kids to school, be left alone. But he says the culture war is interested in you and particularly interested in your children. It's up to you to get involved for their sakes. Here's a case in point from the NEA, the National Education Association. This is, I believe, the biggest teachers union in the country. Educators work hard to provide all students with an accurate and honest, high-quality education. But some decision makers are using ploys to remove certain books from schools. Every student deserves to be reflected and respected. What does that mean? Every student deserves to be reflected. Well, we better put mirrors in at every angle, you know, and make sure that they're being reflected. Oh, that means something else? I mean, when, when you talk about, uh, you know, NEA, when you say that these students need to be reflected and respected and, and using ploys to remove certain books from schools, are we talking about certain books that portray graphic nudity or even graphic uh, deviant sex acts for these kids? Is, is that what it means to reflect these students? Because I'll grant you, maybe, maybe there are some students who feel like, well, you know what, that's, that's my fetish. But I bet you they're, they're very much the exception rather than the rule. And besides, why bring this up to kids in the first place? In other words, the, the whole idea here is, well, if we want to really give these kids a good education, we want to reflect and respect them, they've got to have porn available in their library. Parents, this is where you have to be the one to step up and be brave and draw those lines and say, this is unacceptable. Just like you saw parents step up at the Caldwell School Board meeting a few weeks ago and say, hey, this whole transgender thing about uh, putting biological boys into the girls' bathrooms and, and, and locker rooms at their choice. Well, this is what I feel like today. This is what I'm going to do. You got to draw the line. And the crazy thing is the people in power really don't seem that interested in hearing what you have to say as a parent. It's like it's an afterthought. Look, we're the experts here. We're the ones with a degree and with a certificate in this and that kind of teaching, and therefore we know what's best for your kid. Don't ever buy that line of reasoning. Even a doctor with all those advanced medical degrees and all that advanced, all the advanced years of schooling is not the ultimate authority for what's right for your child. And if, if you saw Chloe Cole's uh, address, actually she gave a couple of different great speeches last week when she was here in Idaho. Once she was in the system, her parents were essentially told, look, if you don't get your daughter this gender-affirming care, she's going to kill herself. I mean, few words will strike fear into the heart of a parent more than the concept of, man, my kid is teetering on the brink of suicide or is experiencing suicidal ideation. And so when a medical professional tells you that, well, here, we better get started on the uh, hormone blockers and get on the uh, binders and start the surgery preps and... You know, parents feel like, well, we're kind of helpless to, to do anything but go along with it. And depending on the state, there may be states that say, well, that's medical neglect. If you don't do something or if something does happen to your child, well, you're going to be held accountable for it. You got to be willing to draw that hard line. And parents, uh, it's it's been tough up until now to find uh, policymakers who are willing to listen. And right now, you know, I I don't believe the state is the answer to all problems. But I think in some cases, the line has to be drawn, and that means that it needs to be drawn legally. And I think this is one of those cases. So I'm, I'm glad to see this legislation moving forward. It's, it's so interesting to see the sophistry and the twisting of words to try to make it sound like, oh, this is just, this is taking freedom from people. They don't care if they're taking freedom from people. They just want to, to advance whatever the agenda is. And in this case, there's very much a woke agenda. All right, shifting gears. School choice is still a big thing. I wanted to share with you a little example of uh, the word magic that we're trying to work through in which uh, if you use the correct words to describe things, it really upsets some people. Case in point, this is a tweet from Connor Boyack from Libertas Institute who points out only 31% of eighth graders are proficient in reading, 30% are below basic readers, functionally illiterate, only 27% of eighth graders are proficient in math, an abysmally failing grade. And he uses the term government schools are pumping out a really low quality project product. And you got to see the response. 
Someone got a little triggered by his use of the term government schools. Darlene McDonald, pay attention to what they say. This is how they're framing public education now. This is how they privatize public education. Government schools. Sounds like something out of a dystopian movie. It's all about provoking fear. Quite intentionally, manipulation. Well, Darlene, Darlin, if I could be so bold, it's about using correct language to describe what's going on. We see this whole uh, reliance on euphemisms when we don't want to address something that's really unpleasant if we uh, call it by what it actually is. I, I'll use the example of, of you know the abortion debate. Abortion activists, those who are pro-abortion, will almost never use the term fetus or unborn child you know, to describe what is being terminated in an abortion procedure. Instead, they'll use terms like product of conception or obligate parasite because those are clinical, detached, you know, they're, they're euphemistic words that, you know, your person really have to kind of think about what it is, product of conception. Well, no, you know, it doesn't really sound all that personal as opposed to, you know, unborn child. And so they use those euphemistic words to shield us from the, the actual reality of what's taking place. In fact, even, even a termination of the pregnancy. How about uh, ending an innocent life? Because that's really what's happening. And one of the ways you can tell that they're being euphemistic is, you know, when, when it comes to things, Joseph Sobrand pointed this out years ago, when it comes to things like uh, insecticide, people don't mince words, you know, remember? Raid, kills bugs, dead. That was one of their big selling points. What does this stuff do? Well, it kills bugs and it kills them dead. In fact, it knocks them dead the moment it touches them. And that's the best thing about it. This is why you want to buy, you know, raid. But they don't do that with, uh, with abortion because if people contemplate too closely what is actually happening, the horror of what is really taking place starts to sink in. And suddenly it becomes a much tougher thing to defend, as it should be. So when it comes to calling uh, public schools, government schools, you know, that's just the way it's it's got to be if you're going to be accurate about it. And the fact that it's bothering some people, oh, that sounds so dystopian. Well, yeah, it does. That's cognitive dissonance, by the way, that you're feeling if you're having trouble with that. Because you're trying to reconcile that this is the best and only way that kids should be educated. But when you put it in terms of, but uh, but it's the government that's doing it, well, that, that sounds like a bad thing. Well, maybe it is. By the way, Connor responds, well, the government created, controls, operates, and funds these schools. They exist only with the blessing and support of the government. They are inherently part of the political process. They're not public. He says that's too benign a word. They are government schools through and through. I got to give him high points for, for using correct terminology to say what needs to be said. All right. Speaking of what needs to be said, look at this. An $8,500 workforce training grant bill squeaks through the Idaho House on a close vote. In fact, uh, training grants, could we could we call those vouchers? Would that be a voucher by any other name? Luke Mayfield, you want to you want to comment on this? Just <laughs> just thought I would ask. They're so opposed to any kind of school choice. But by gosh, when the governor steps up and says, hey, I'm going to spend over one hundred million dollars to help send graduates to, to trade schools. That's supposed to be a good thing, but I want you to see what Brian Allman from the uh, Idaho Freedom Foundation says in breaking down this move toward a command economy. He says, House Bill 24, the Idaho launch bill, passed the House yesterday afternoon by a razor-thin margin after more than an hour of spirited debate. Representative Megan Blanksma is the House sponsor, but Governor Little has been the driving force behind the bill which would expand the existing Idaho launch grant program, providing $8,500 per high school graduate, that's $102 million overall, for technical education and workforce training. I know it sounds like a good thing, but here's the problem. Brian says the Idaho Freedom Foundation strongly opposes this bill because it significantly expands a government program, subsidizes corporate training programs, and distributes money to certain industries as determined by the unelected Workforce Development Council. What that means is government and some of its partners on that Workforce Development Counselor are picking winners and losers as to who receives that money. Does that seem right to you? Now, opponents of the bill made many excellent points during the House debate. Representative David Cannon stated the obvious that this bill was a step away from free markets and a step in the direction of a command economy. Rather than letting the market decide which careers are in demand, this bill allows the Workforce Development Council to use those grants to push students toward certain areas. 
Representative Jason Monks also brought up basic economics, explaining that if students are allocated a free, by the way, that's proper use of the quotation marks, free $8,500 from government, then the price of workforce development is surely going to go up by a commensurate amount. Monks also pointed out that many of these corporations are already paying for their own workforce development. So once again, this bill is a thinly disguised handout. And Representative Brett Crane, Brent Crane rather, gave what should have been the final nail in this bill's coffin when he explained the nature of government programs. Once we start it, we're never going back. Now that's a point worth considering too. Once a government program finds its way into being, good luck getting rid of it. They just have a way of sticking around, expanding, and there's always going to be the cost of implementing the program and then keeping it going down the road. Plus, it's handing off a significant amount of personal responsibility and things which could be solved by the free market to government actors instead. Never a good idea. Once it's there, it's very, very tough to get rid of. Well, thanks for tuning in. I hope this is at least giving you some cause to think. I don't expect you to agree with everything that I'm sharing with you, but I also would encourage you to, to please bring that same sense of skepticism to everything that you are reading and seeing in your legacy media. It's very clear that there are word games that they like to play. There are, are rhetorical sleight of hand techniques that they like to use to try to show you that, oh, yes, this is all on the up and up and you can trust us. But you got to be willing to think for yourself. And hopefully this program is encouraging you to do exactly that. I'm Brian Hyde, and this is Nowhere to Hide. Are biased, the Idaho Press Club are biased, all media, newspaper, radio. To be completely blunt here, Brian, and there are plans to expand indoctrination. That's right. Well, Idahoans are also concerned. Horror shot. That line would be moving a little bit farther west. I'm like crying. Nobody wants to Dark see. Dark money is influencing policy in our state. Well, that's not